Greetings, grace and peace be with you. I'm Paul Stevens. I'm the ordained minister in placement at St. Luke's Uniting Church in Highton. And a special welcome again to the uh, members of Belmont Uniting Church who are joining with us as the Reverend Akani Vatoi is away. And if you're watching us for the first time, a welcome to you too. And please feel free to get in touch with us. You can use the contact details that are available on our website. That's St. Luke's Uniting Church in Highton. We love to get your feedback and we take it seriously. And also we like to hear from where you're watching these videos because people watch them from quite interesting places, sometimes as distant as London. Recently, we've been dipping into the epic story of God's liberation of the people of Israel as recorded in the book of Exodus. And this week we'll be looking at perhaps the central event of this grand narrative, perhaps the central event of the whole of the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew scripture, that is the crossing of the Red Sea. Let's enter into a time of prayer. Let's pray. You, Lord, are our strength and our song. You will not let injustice, chaos and evil prevail. You are our God and we will praise you, the God of the generations and we will exalt you. You are a God of compassion and freedom. You hear the cries of those who are in need. You led your people of old with cloud by day and fire by night. You parted the sea with your breath. You did not allow the chariots of Pharaoh to prevail and saved your people from oppression. Free us, O God, from those things and powers that enslave us in our day. Deliver us, good Lord, from all that would prevent us from following the way of Jesus. Help us to look honestly at our lives. May your spirit soften our hearts where needed and bring transformation. Aid us when our trust in you wavers. Challenge us if we become quarrelsome in nature and turn us around when we seek to go our own way. Gracious God, have mercy on us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the chapters of the book of Exodus leading up to today's Bible passage, we read about the toing and froing between Moses, along with his brother Aaron, and the Egyptian ruler, Pharaoh. We read how Moses and Aaron, guided by God, sought to get Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go, to release them from slavery. And we learn sadly, of course, that Pharaoh kept refusing, that his heart hardened against them, sometimes through his own doing, and sometimes using language that is somewhat confronting, through the intervention of God. In these chapters, we read too of the 10 plagues that were inflicted upon the people of Egypt. The Nile turned to blood. There was a plague of frogs, gnats, flies. There was a plague that killed livestock. There were boils, ugh, hail, locusts, darkness. And then of course, a final terrible plague which left the firstborn of each Egyptian household dead. We read too in these chapters of the experience of the people of Israel on that night that the angel of death struck the homes of the Egyptian people. A night which people of Jewish faith still today, each year, recapitulate through the celebration of the Passover. It was a night on which following God's command, the people of Israel ate the first Passover meal and did so dressed, ready to flee, with sandals on their feet and a staff in hand. It was a night on which they left slavery, 
the night on which they did flee, because Pharaoh and the Egyptians finally relented and let them go. But of course, we read too how Pharaoh and the Egyptian people soon decided that they needed the slave labour that the Israelites provided. Pharaoh's heart was hardened again, and he sent his chariots into the wilderness after the people of Israel. So the scene is set now for our reading. It is like the setup for the big climactic scene in a Hollywood blockbuster movie, long before Hollywood was even thought about. Things seem dire. The, the Israelites are wedged between, on one hand, the destructive fury of Pharaoh and his minions, and on the other, a place of chaos and primeval fear for Israelites, the sea. Bible reading, a reading from Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 to 14 and 19 to 31, from the New Living Bible Translation. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptian overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this will happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slave in, to Egypt, to the Egyptian. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid, just stand still and watch the Lord rescue, rescue today. The Egyptian you will see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Then the angel of God who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The cloud settled between the Egyptian and Israelite camps. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptian and Israelites did not approach each other all night. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with strong east wind. The wind blew all the night, turning the seabed into a dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground, with walls of water on each side. Then the Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots and charities, chased them into the middle of the sea. But just before dawn of the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from the pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw their forces into total confusion. He twisted their chariot wheels, making their chariots difficult to drive. Let's get out of here, away from this Israelites. The Egyptian shouted, the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. When all the Israelites has reached the other side, the Lord says to Moses, raise your hand over the sea again. Then the waters will will rush back and cover all the Egyptians and their chariot and charities. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the water rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. Then the waters returned and covered all the 
chariots and charioteers, the entire army of Pharaoh. Of all the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites into the sea, not a single one survived. But the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground, and the water stood up like a wall on both sides. That is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Amen. Well, what did you make of that? For Jewish people, this is a, if not the, historic story of their faith. The God they worship today is the same God who liberated the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. The God they worship today is the same God who saved the people of Israel from the armies of Pharaoh and from the catastrophic forces of the sea, who brought them to safety, who gave them dry land to walk upon. And we Christians would say much the same thing, but we would also add that this God is the same God that we encounter in the person of Jesus. For Jews and Christians, the God we proclaim is a God who saves us from slavery and from catastrophe. Now, there are umpteen articles, not to mention umpteen YouTube videos, about what is supposed to have exactly happened when the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea. You know, there's all sorts of arguments about which sea it was, etc., etc. And this is all kind of interesting, and it's kind of interesting speculation. But there is a danger in all of this, and that danger is that we miss what this text is plainly telling us. For what we can say is that this story stands at the core of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, that a profound word about the saving nature of God is revealed here, that God is a God who will not allow the forces of darkness and devastation to prevail. And this, as Christians, we would argue, is declared even more astoundingly through the resurrection of Christ from the grave. Now, let me make two points before I go any further. First, did you notice in the text that Moses was dealing not just with the rampaging army of Egypt, but those who were moaning and groaning in his own camp, who thought whips and slavery did not seem so bad compared with the situation that they were now in? Sisters and brothers, even though there's three and a half thousand years between then and now, humans are still humans. And secondly, let's be clear that the members of Pharaoh's army are victims. Real people with families, caught up in Pharaoh's nefarious doings, sacrificed like so many before and since in a pointless battle. Yet let me say it again. Core to this passage is an understanding that God overcomes the forces of chaos, represented here both by Pharaoh and his army and the deep, scary sea. God is a God of new creation and liberation, who confronts and deals with the dark forces of the universe. <clears throat> and sisters and brothers, this isn't just a theoretical affirmation. To know, what, to know that God will not allow evil to prevail is a statement of profound hope. In concluding my reflection, I want to read a few short section, sections of an amazing sermon by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, given at the Cathedral of John the Divine in New York in 1956. And his sermon was based on this text. The sermon is entitled, The Death of Evil Upon the Seashore. Can I encourage you to look it up on the internet? You can easily find a copy of it and read the whole text. His soaring words for me jumped straight off the page and stirred my soul. King begins by pointing to the reality of evil as portrayed in the Bible and in the history of the world. Let me quote. There is hardly anything more obvious than the fact that evil is present in the universe. It projects its nagging prehensile tentacles into every level of human existence. 
and he continues a little later with a fleshing out of what evil looks like. We have seen it in high places where men are willing to sacrifice truth on the altars of their self-interest. We have seen it in imperialistic nations trampling over other nations with the iron feet of oppression. We have seen it clothed in the calamitous wars which left battlefields painted with blood, filled nations with widows and orphans, and sent men home physically handicapped and psychologically wrecked. And then in the second half of the sermon, he connects directly with the check, with the test, with the text, and he says, But as soon as the Egyptians got into the Red Sea, the parted waves swept back upon them, and the rushing waters of the sea soon drowned all of them. As the Israelites looked back, all they could see was here and there a poor, drowned body beaten upon the seashore. For the Israelites, this was a great moment. It was the end of a frightful period in their history. It was a joyous daybreak that had come to end the long night of their, ketap, of their captivity. But then he says, it symbolizes something much deeper than the drowning of a few men. For no one can rejoice at the death or the, or the defeat of a human person. This story at bottom symbolizes the death of evil. It was the death of inhuman oppression and ungodly exploitation. Martin Luther King then connects this with the experience of his people, the African-American people, who he says for too long had been oppressed by pharaohs with hardened hearts. Now, King spoke at a time in which there were strong signs that the segregation that had uh, inflicted the US for so long was coming to an end. But today, today, in reality, those with hardened hearts still stalk this planet, and inhuman oppression and ungodly exploitation still confront us on a daily basis. We see it on our TV screens, if not in our own daily lives. But the crossing of the Red Sea, sisters and brothers, points to one clear thing. Victory is with God. The resurrection of the crucified one, sisters and brothers, points to one clear thing. Victory is with God. Slavery and evil will come to an end, sisters and brothers. Even death will not have the last word, sisters and brothers. Alleluia. Alleluia. I thought it would be appropriate, given what I've said in the reflection, to use two prayers by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as our prayers of intercession. Even though these the words of his prayers are decades old, they do speak to our time. And I will leave a pause between them for you to add your own prayers. I will quote his words exactly. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the inspiration of Jesus. Grant that we will love you with all our hearts, souls and minds and love our neighbors as we love ourselves even our enemy neighbours. And we ask you, God, in these days of emotional tension, when the problems of the world are gigantic in extent and chaotic in detail, to be with us in our going out and our coming in, in our rising up and in our lying down, in our moments of joy and in our moments of sorrow, until the day when there shall be no sunset and no dawn. Amen. We thank you for your church, founded upon your word, that challenges us to do more than sing and pray, but to go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depended on us and not upon you. Help us to realize that humanity was created to shine like the stars and live on through all eternity. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together, pray together, sing together and live together until that day when all God's children, black, white, red, brown, and yellow, will rejoice in one common band of humanity, in the reign of our Lord and of our God, we pray. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, 
and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, in this time in which the impact of COVID-19 is still great, and many are suffering and many are in need, know that the God who is a God who will prevail is with you. Take care, look after yourselves and look after those that you love. And here is a blessing, the words that Aaron used as a blessing. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.